The world's ocean covers 71% of the planet's surface, and scientists say it is now under threat of irreparable damage. Legendary marine biologist Dr. Sylvia Earle has been one of the ocean's fiercest guardians for more than half a century. She was deemed a living legend by the U.S. Library of Congress, a hero for our planet by Time magazine, and has been referred to as her deepness. Her latest book is out this week, Ocean, a Global Odyssey. Thank you so much for joining us tonight your deepness. <laughs> First, I want to start off with talking about COP26. You were there for some of it. Were there any meaningful commitments that, that you feel optimistic about as far as the future of our oceans? The ocean was, for the first time, really front and center. And it's it should be obvious that the ocean drives climate and weather. We think of the atmosphere as <laughs> where climate and weather functions, but there would not be a climate, there would not be weather <laughs> without the ocean. The oxygen that is generated comes mostly from the sea. Carbon dioxide once was a principal part of the atmosphere of Earth, and it's the living planet, land and sea, that has drawn down that carbon dioxide and generated oxygen, and has made Earth habitable for us. So that is finally getting recognition and the problems of what we're taking out of the ocean, what we're putting into the ocean, altering the nature of that system that really makes our existence possible is, is now really being seriously taken into account and also the need to protect it, which is what I really try to describe why the ocean matters to everyone, everywhere, all the time in this book with National Geographic. Right, we see that in your book so vividly paired with the just stunning and vibrant pictures. During your career, you have lived underwater and completed literally thousands of dives. What's the most stunning sight that you've ever seen in the deep seas? Well, I think most people don't appreciate that most of life on Earth lives in the dark all of the time. You get below where sunlight shines, which is about a thousand feet or so, a little bit further, but life goes all the way, seven miles, 11 kilometers down. And it's, it's the largest living space, the greatest diversity and abundance on earth is out there, down there. And we're just beginning to seriously map it. Only about 15% of the ocean floor has been mapped with the same degree of accuracy that we have for the land or, or even the moon or Mars. And with respect to exploration of the ocean, we're just beginning. More people have walked on the moon than have been to the deepest part of the ocean until just this past year. Now, more than a dozen people have made that descent. But all of the space from top to bottom is mostly, you know, space that we have yet to explore. And yet it keeps us alive. This is the greatest era of opportunity, of exploration, and need to care for the living ocean. In one portion of the book titled On a Sour Note, you write about three actions that humans continue to do that profoundly alter nature, zeroing in on water. What's the biggest threat to the ocean right now? I really focus on what we're taking out of the ocean, the living ocean. On the land, we're concerned about clear-cutting forests, clear-cutting wildlife. We think of them as fish and shrimp and squid and things, but they're wild animals that we're taking on an industrial scale. The high seas in particular, beyond national jurisdiction, if given full protection from industrial fishing, think of life in the sea, and we did get this at COP26, blue carbon, the, the life in the ocean, like trees on the land, hold carbon, sequester carbon, keep it in the ground, in the ocean, instead of letting it escape into the atmosphere. We hear your dogs getting excited as you talk about their, their fellow animals uh, on, on the water side of things. <laughs> At one point, you write that the green economy is it's basically blue. Can you elaborate on that? Well, again, if we, if we think about what keeps our existence possible, it's natural systems, there would be no economy if we did not have air to breathe, water to drink, a place to live, and a healthy planet. We often think that there's there's opposition 
uh, economy here, environment there, but actually they're totally interconnected. Sound economy is totally dependent on a sound environment. With so much happening right now, a lot of people are experiencing what they describe as climate anxiety. After all of the challenges to our ocean that we've just discussed, why do you feel that people should be hopeful? What do you cling to? Uh, because now we know. Imagine if we did not know. We'd continue doing the same destructive things, believing that everything would be fine. But we have evidence. We've learned more since the middle of the 20th century. Satellites up in the sky, humans up in the sky, gathering evidence showing how everything connects. And we know what to do. We know that protecting nature gives benefits, not just to our survival, our existence, our health, but the, our economy really depends on maintaining planet in a, in a way that is favorable to us. So this is <laughs> cause for hope. I think our superpower of knowing is the greatest reason for hope. Kids know what the smartest people who ever lived before the middle of the 20th century, they're aware of what Earth looks like from space. They know we have problems with climate. And we also know that when you start protecting nature, recovery is possible. But we really have to hurry. The next 10 years, climate scientists say, and I think there's plenty of evidence, it will be kind of make or break. But isn't it great that we know what to do and we have some real evidence about what works? We just have to get busy and do it. And you talk about, this is my last one to you, you talk about that quest for knowing. You've already accomplished so much and, and explored and researched. Was there anything when you were putting together this book that, that surprised you or that you learned that, that you weren't aware of before? I think the, you'll note that in every chapter, there is reference to what is known as hope spots. These are places that communities and, and champions around the world have nominated that if we can safeguard large areas of the ocean, and safeguard large areas of the land, we will reverse this trend that we're now experiencing from decline to recovery. And the dogs agree. They do, 101 Dalmatians over there. Thank you so much, Dr. Earl, for joining us. You can purchase National Geographic Ocean, a global odyssey, wherever books are sold. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.